You want to know who's the youngest professor ever hired in Duke University Law School history? You'll meet him coming up next on Carolina People. Good morning. Welcome to Carolina People. This morning we're at the Fox 43 studio. We're focused on the life of a Carolinian who's been practicing law more than five decades. Robinson Oscar Everett, my dad. Good morning, Dad. How are you? Well, I tell you, Craig, it's great to be with you, to be here being interviewed by my own son. My goodness. I tell you, it's kind of strange. It was so exciting to kick off uh, this week, kick off yesterday with Mickey Spillane and to go the next few days with you. And I know folks are thinking, why the heck is he interviewing his dad for a few days? And I tell you, one of the thrills was uh, last week's Myrtle Beach Herald came out, and we were able to reprint the introductory remarks from an attorney in Charlotte, Norfleet Pruden, the uh, president, the former past president of the North Carolina Bar Association. Some of his comments leading into the introduction, or the introduction for the John J. Parker Award, which was given back on June 19th up at the Grove Park Inn. And, it, and if any viewers, of course, viewers in the PD or southeastern North Carolina are able to get a copy of the Myrtle Beach Herald to go online at MyrtleBeachHerald.com. They'll be able to read and get an idea as to why we're highlighting you for a couple days. Well, you're mighty generous, and they were, too. They really were. That's right. It was very special. Dad, real quick, you know, I never asked you that. As a child, did you always have plans to be a lawyer? Absolutely not. I was going to try to be a detective. I thought that would be exciting. Then I got to college. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And uh, <clears throat> then uh, right at the end of college, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't have a job. Um, I thought, well, my mother and dad, they're both lawyers. They'll hire me if I, uh, if I learn law. So um, I applied to law school and got in, did okay, and the rest is history. So you were, you were finishing college and still had no idea, truly had no idea, you're saying during your entire youth, while you, both your parents are lawyers, you're hanging out at the court or you're hanging out at home, you never aspired to be an attorney? Not really. Um, at one time when I was studying courses in international relations, <clears throat> I said, well, I'd like to be an international lawyer. Right. I didn't know what that meant, and there weren't very many of them. Um, if I'd gone forward on that, I don't think I'd have gotten anywhere. And then... Um, a friend of mine was going over, I was at Harvard, and a friend of mine was going over to the Harvard Law School, and he said, you ever been over there? I said, no. He said, walk over with me. I said, why are you going? He said, I'm going to apply to law school. I said, I'll walk over there with you. I walked over, he applied. Seemed like a good idea, so I applied. At that time, it was a lot easier to get in than it is now. <laughs> this was right at the end of World War II and uh, they hadn't had that influx of veterans yet. And I was able to get in and, and went. That's amazing. And not only went, Dad, I think you finished up, what, fourth in a class of 400 I was, yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, but not too bad. I did okay. Right. I was lucky. You know, it was so exciting. I was reading an article you'd done on your mother in fall of 1994 for the North Carolina Bar Quarterly, highlighting women in the legal profession. And in there, you talked about her being having great secretarial skills as well as being a great brief writer. And there was an experience during law school where I think you had hepatitis. Yeah. And she was up there and was able to sit in. And there was a, you talked about in that article, Dean Irwin Griswold. Can you share with the viewers a little bit about that story? I know that jumps forward a little bit. I want to get back to your youth. But uh... well, uh, I was uh, sick, couldn't go to class, and my mother uh, knew shorthand. She'd been. Uh, she worked with her father, who was a lawyer. She was sort of the office secretary, and then she became a lawyer and practiced with him. But anyhow, she knew I shorthand. I wasn't going to be able to go to class. She was up there at Harvard with me trying to take care of me. And so I said, Mom, would you go over and attend the classes and take notes? So she did. The only problem was that uh, it was an all-male institution uh, at that time. There were no women at the Harvard Law School. So she shows up to take notes, and Dean Griswold, who taught the course I was taking at that time on tax law, he had had a woman reporter in there shortly before who had written a story that apparently he didn't like. And he thought my mother was some kind of reporter. 
and he was getting ready to throw out when uh, one of the students, one of my fellow students said, Dean, she's not a reporter, she's just taking notes for her son who couldn't be here, he's sick. And so he let us stay, she took notes. I did very well that semester. <laughs> <laughs> she took a lot better notes than I did. <laughs> I'm sure she did. That's great, Dad, that's a great story. You know, it was so exciting, it was amazing going through uh, trying to prep. I mean, how do you prep for many interviews? How do you prep for a parent? I mean, how do you go through preparing for a, a mother or a father? If you're proud of them, uh, whoever it is, it, it, it's kind of difficult. Uh, I got to say, one of the great things I was able to do over the last couple of days was to go back to some articles written about you or some other things you'd written that enabled me to get a, a fresh perspective of you. There was a great piece in the Raleigh News and Observer in 93 when you were recognized, I think, as the uh, Tar Heel of the Week. And it helped give me a good feel of looking back at your life and talked a little bit about your youth. Can you share with the viewers a little bit about what it was like growing up in Durham in the 30s and early 40s? Well, I was an only child, and <clears throat> so I probably got a lot better care than uh, the most. I went to Durham High School. At that time, that was the best high school in North Carolina, probably. And uh, we usually did well in statewide competitions. We had a great basketball and football team. Um, Durham was primarily a tobacco town. If I were walking home from school, um, I'd walk right past the tobacco factory, and uh, the odor of tobacco, the smell of tobacco was everywhere. Um, Durham had Duke University, which was uh, an outstanding school, but not like it is today, not world famous. And uh, my parents knew, the, knew some of the professors, so I got to meet some professors early on. So it was interesting uh, academic atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose that at that point, Durham was probably racially split about two to one uh, white African American. Um, unlike today, there were no uh, Hispanics as a practical matter. It was a quiet town. We had four or five uh, movie theaters, and uh, I loved to go to them. I went to a lot of movies. That was the main entertainment. Um, we didn't seem to have as much uh, crime as in a later time. Uh, nobody was worried about drugs then. They didn't know what coke was or heroin or marijuana. It was a pretty quiet and peaceful environment. Mm -hmm. Dad, now neither of your parents were actually raised in Durham, but both had lived there for quite a while, I guess. Uh, yeah, my, um, my dad uh, had been reared on a farm down in eastern North Carolina. Um, he was a, one of the first five law students at Trinity College, which later became Duke. So Duke says he was one of their first five law students. When he finished um, college at Carolina, <clears throat> he came to Duke. To, he came to Durham as a teacher, and he, he, he read law. Mm -hmm. And then he qualified as a, as a lawyer, and he liked Durham. He stayed there. So he got there in 1903. And along about 1924, he went to a bar meeting, a bar association meeting, and met a young lady lawyer who happened to be my mother. She was practicing with her dad in Fedville, where she had been raised. And uh, they met, and two years later got married. So then she moved up to Durham. Mm -hmm. And uh, that meant she was about 23 years later than him getting there. But uh, they both... They both liked it and stayed, and uh, uh, Mother had quite a career there. She was on the city council. My dad was in the state legislature from Durham. They developed a lot of roots there, and so for me, staying in Durham really seemed to be the only choice. So, so you finished law school and came straight back to Durham? Oh, uh, Actually, I did. I came back uh, to do something I never expected to do, namely to teach law. Uh, at Duke uh, Law School, uh, <coughs> a friend of, um, uh, of my dad was at the time the university council at Duke, right? And they had a vacancy; they needed somebody. Somebody had just left, and so um, they uh, asked me to teach. And 
<laughs> there I was, age 22, trying to teach law. At age 22? Yeah, I was the youngest law teacher they've ever had by far. And it was an interesting experience. What um, was that like? Yeah, most of your students, or all of your students, would have been older than you. Probably 95%. That's insane. <laughs> it was, it's a challenge. Yeah, it's a challenge. I'm sure. I know. I know. That, I can't imagine that. I mean, when we think now, of course, so many folks are finishing college at age 21 or 22 to then have gone through. Now, how were you able to do that? Did you skip some grades early on? or? Yeah, I skipped, um, <coughs> I skipped a grade in college, and I started school early, and I skipped a couple of grades in high school. Okay. So I entered um, a law school at age 19, finished at 22, and uh, went on from there. Well, you know, I, I hear that story about um, I hear that story about you actually finishing high school, and then because you were so young, I believe going off to is it Phillips Exeter That's in New right Hampshire here. for a year. Yeah. And then I think I saw that you came back. Expecting to go to UNC, Chapel Hill, and started at Chapel Hill. Sure did. And I think that, it, am I correct, that you began pledging a fraternity? I was an ATO. Is that right? So you began pledging a fraternity and maybe had a little too much fun? I had too much fun. My parents said, you're not going to stay here anymore. You're going to go up to uh, to of it. I would, because I had done this extra work at Exeter. I qualified for admission at Harvard. They, it was sort of a feeder school. Right. And so I went up there, and um, they treated me not as a postgrad, but as a uh, just a member of the class of 1944. Right. So um, I wound up um, graduating there. Um, I graduated in 1943 at Durham High, and um, I go to the uh, reunions of the 1943 class when I graduated and the 45 class when I would have graduated. Wow. They should be coming up next year. That's amazing. Yeah. They're all very good to me. Yeah, I know, Dan. They must be. You know, it was, it was so exciting to go back and to look at, to, to try to look back, uh, as I said, going back to some articles written about you, going back to some things you've written on your own, uh, to see some, some memories that are hashed up, and a lot of them go back when you talk about your mother. And... Uh, can you share with the viewers a little bit about, because and I know this is about you, but it's so exciting <laughs> since uh, your mother, my grandmother, started practice in 1920, I believe. That's right. The same year that women got uh, the right to vote. Well, that's, that's uh, very true. She got a law license the same year. And uh, not only that, <clears throat> she graduated number one in her class at law school. Wow. And she was number one to take the bar exam. Um, she had a remarkable career. I think she was um, a vice president of the North Carolina Bar Association three or four years after she got admitted to the bar. Mm. Um, she was always active in the bar. Um, she uh, was one of the first two women city council members in Durham. She was the president of all sorts of organizations, uh, business and professional women, Daughters of the Confederacy, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Very active in the church. She was one of the uh, first women elders uh, in the, what was that, Southern Presbyterian Church. Um, or maybe they'd merged by then, the Northern and Southern. And there's an interesting story there um, the, that uh, <clears throat> I nominated my mother to be an elder. I didn't know that under the rules of the Southern Presbyterian Church, they had no women elders. The, uh, the Northern Presbyterian Church did. And when I was in the military, I'd been out of West Texas and went to a Northern Presbyterian Church. So we were having a congregational meeting, and I went ahead and nominated her. And uh, thinking she'd be a great elder, she was very dedicated and so forth. And there was a long silence, <clears throat> and somebody said, you can't do that. She's a woman. And I, <clears throat> I said, well, I thought you could. I've been to churches where women served as elders and deacons, and I thought that was okay. And uh, again, a long silence, and one of the members of the congregation 
who was very active, said, well, uh, women should be allowed to serve, and so I'm going to move that our church make an overture to the Presbytery uh, and on up to the Synod and the General Assembly that the Book of Ch Church ought to be changed to allow women to be pastors, elders, deacons. And that in turn happened. Our mm -hmm. congregation made that overture. That was the overture that moved forward. It takes time, several years. And in fact, I think it was 40 years ago when they first allowed women to um, to serve as elders in the Southern Presbyterian Church. But it all began there, really, with the nomination of my mother. And <laughs> I guess it's one of those things where sometimes you do something get ignorance, it turns out okay. Right. Golly, Dad. And sometimes you do things very directly that turn out okay as well. You know, that, and that makes me think, and of course it's so exciting you talked about that, that Tar Heel, the weak, weak piece. Primarily it was highlighted because of your insistence of pursuing uh, a fight for a, a colorblind society and working hard and launching uh, a series of cases that went up to the uh, up to the US Supreme Court and I go back to this piece from the the article the Tar Heel of the Week striving for a colorblind society a self-described moderate Democrat Everett does not seem like the gadfly type a friendly man who bears a passing resemblance to Alfred Hitchcock Everett lives in a ground floor unit of a bland apartment complex not far from Duke's West Campus. I lived there then, I still do. You have been in, <coughs> in an apartment, lived oh, in an sure. apartment, a ground floor apartment since the late 60s. Yeah. Almost uh, f 40 years. Well, I mean, you and your two brothers were in it. Yeah, of course, yeah. I understand, but I, well, what prompted life in an apartment for three and a half decades? Well, one of the things was that my mother and I built the apartments. Uh, so we owned the land, uh, bought the land, built the apartments. And it's nice to be your own landlord. So um, uh, when I got married, uh, uh, I'd been living at home. Uh, I was free. I was 38 when I got married. Had a child bride, your mother. And so um, we moved into an apartment. Uh, and then my mother and I developed this apartment project right out here at Duke, which was very convenient. And so um, my wife and I moved in there, and we liked it. And, uh, you know, it was handy. Why move somewhere else? Uh, so we just stayed there. Mm. But going back to that, <clears throat> that article, that um, reminds me of the fact that I've been called a gadfly, I've been called a troublemaker sometimes. But I hope my motives were okay. Uh, when I began that litigation, what I was concerned about was that the government, at that point, the federal government, was requiring the congressional districts be organized so that some of them were a majority minority. Majority black uh, was another term for it. And uh, they would create these strange um, districts uh, which were designed to assure that an African-American was elected to um, to Congress. It was sort of a quota system, and they used the new technology, uh, computer technology, to split things up in such a way mm -hmm. that it would be assured, practically, that uh, uh, African-Americans would be elected from the particular districts. Uh, it was sort of a, it was sometimes referred to as pack black, bleach white. Uh, because I meant the other districts would be would contain a very very small percentage of African Americans, and I thought that was wrong to um, be um, setting up a system to elect people on the basis of race. Um, I didn't think a quota system was constitutional, mm -hmm. and uh, I thought somebody should do something about it, and so um, uh, we went ahead and did something. I uh, I got five people together, myself being one of them. Oh, uh, you were one of them. Uh, I remember getting you into it. You were a student then, studying political science at Wake Forest, and this gave you a chance to learn about political science. Um, another was a fellow professor of mine 
at Duke Law School who was a uh, very dedicated person in connection with uh, trying to assure colorblind society. And uh, then there was uh, a lady who had, who had been a client of mine. She was a widow of a professor who had been killed in a very tragic accident. And she'd been on the election board, and she was sort of a crusader for for fairness and equality in the colorblind society. And um, and so she was the lead plaintiff. And the five of us uh, sued everybody. We sued the president. I guess it was we sued the attorney general of the United States. We sued the North Carolina legislature. Um, we... Uh, relied on the federal constitution primarily and uh, it was really a, a strange situation um, the um, administration at that time was the Bush administration it was not famous, the first Bush administration, which was not famous for affirmative action but in this area, this field of um, racial gerrymandering that was a big thing because they figured that if they could pack blacks, as it were, uh, the other districts would be more likely to uh, elect Republicans, and that ultimately there could be a majority. I didn't know this at the time, but we learned about it. Uh, so in North Carolina, they insisted on having uh, two uh, majority, minority, majority black districts. And these were the strangest things you ever saw, which is why I knew that they were racially German. I mean, the way they took Durham, for example, and split it up and had a district extending from Durham all the way down to Gastonia, just as wide as a highway, uh, not, not any wider, uh, is so, so strange. And uh, uh, later I learned that it, it had a political motivation. But the irony was that in North Carolina, the legislature, which was controlled by Democrats, was able to figure out a gerrymander which did that and also gerrymandered the other districts so that the Republicans would not take control. Mm. And the Republicans actually attacked the district that was created, the two, attacked the plan that was created. And um, so ultimately we sued five of us as individuals, all Democrats. And um, then in turn, the Supreme, we lost in the trial court uh, two to one on a motion that just threw us out and basically you know, said, these guys don't have anything, why waste our time? Well, we decided we'd appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. You could go directly there. And um, the Supreme Court granted review of the case. They decided to grant review and that was a strange situation because at that point the Republican Party intervened on our side and uh, there were other groups that intervened on our side uh, one of them being the American Jewish Congress as I recall and on the other hand uh, on the other side they had these uh, amicus briefs and everything the uh, ACLU uh, various others uh, the uh, NAACP uh, and so we're there in the Supreme Court with sort of a strange alignment and the Supreme Court rules in our favor it was right at the end of the uh, Supreme Court term just like the other day they handed down at the end of the term the cases uh, on detainees and the Supreme Court said we were right you can't do that sort of thing you can't racially gerrymand them and uh, sent it back for a trial. Uh, at that point, the um, uh, the state said, well, it really wasn't racial gerrymandering anyway, uh, but we were able to uh, prove to the contrary, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. at least to the satisfaction of the Supreme Court. Because we had to go back up there again, we were successful again. <laughs> and they said to the North Carolina legislature, you gotta change this. And then they uh, drew other plans, but that was that was something I worked on for eight or nine years, and uh, it's one of those things you get involved in. You want to make sure it's carried out right. You just don't stop. 
And I want to highlight that. And, and uh, Dan, how would you feel about coming back tomorrow to talk a little bit more about uh, the Shaw line of cases, as well as some of the reasons behind uh, behind that? Sure. Okay. If you're willing to invite me back, I'll come back. We're doing that right now. Absolutely. Stay tuned to more Carolina people with the Honorable Robinson Oscar Everett coming up next. Everything he does, he does with a passion. If you heard him talking about it the last 30 minutes, the fun of pledging a fraternity at Chapel Hill and getting pulled out and shipped up to Boston to attend school up there, or the fun of battling gerrymanders in the U.S. Supreme Court. Whatever he does, he sticks with it and he goes hard. You can catch him tomorrow right here on Carolina People. <laughs>